I'm Hannah Dietrich, uh, and today I'll be talking about lava flow monitoring and forecasting that was aided by remote sensing during the 2018 eruption of Kilauea volcano in Hawaii. Uh, this is work I've done with a number of USGS collaborators, but has also greatly benefited from those who aided in eruption response. Kilauea volcano is in East Hawaii Island um, and was until 2018 erupting for more than 35 years from the Pu'u'o event in the Middle East Rift Zone of Kilauea volcano. Uh, more recently, there was an active summit lava lake for 10 years within the caldera of Kilauea caldera. Uh, and then uh, in 2018, magma propagated further down the rift uh, and erupted in the lower east rift zone within a neighborhood called Leilani Estates. Uh, the eruption, the fuse of eruption occurred in sort of three phases. Uh, the first phase, the first couple of weeks were characterized by oh, the opening of many, many small fissures. You can see those here in this thermal map overlaid on um, a satellite image of Leilani Estates. Uh, and these were all very, very small, short-lived fissure eruptions, um, producing very small Popovei lava flows for the most part. Um, but starting in mid-May, the effusion rates increased quite dramatically. Um, the flows were larger, they were longer lived, and the magma that was erupting uh, was hotter and lower viscosity. Um, so these flows were able to travel much, much further. Uh, in influence areas downhill from the neighborhood of Leilani Estates. And then in late May, activity really focused just on one fissure, fissure number eight, um, and produced a very long, long-lived channel system uh, that persisted for more than two months until the end of the eruption in August. Uh, so what you can see from the chronology is the um, sort of some of the challenges in monitoring and forecasting this eruption. Uh, it was characterized by many, many events. They were changing all the time. Um, the uh, eruption occurred over, the, over a seven kilometer stretch of the rift zone um, from the most uprift to most downrift fissures. Uh, and fissures would erupt, uh, stop erupting, and then reactivate. Also, uh, overflows and um, levee failures within the flows um, produced flow branching. So there were um, many sort of active sources to keep track of over the course of the eruption. As you can see, there were also evolving effusion rates, uh, more than two orders of magnitude changes in effusion rates, as well as rheology that produced a really wide range of eruptive behavior. And so to forecast flows, uh, fundamentally lava flows are gravity currents, they flow downhill. And if we have a good sense of the topography, we can uh, sort of figure out where um, flows are most likely to go, the path they're most likely to take. But the complex dynamics of these flows, those changing effusion rates, the evolution from very small Pohohe lava flows to very large channelized lava flows really limits our ability to actually forecast advance rates during this eruption. So traditionally, lava flow forecasting in Hawaii has been done using lines of steepest descent. These are the blue lines on this map, uh, and they are um, this, the centers of drainages. So equivalent to a watershed, um, these are uh, the drainages that lava flows might follow when they follow the terrain. Um, but of course, they don't incorporate uh, any sort of uncertainty in the terrain, uh, and they're somewhat simplified and don't start at an eruption source, uh, like an active vent, say. So in this eruption, um, we wanted to a tool to forecast from specific active new vents, active overflows or flow fronts, uh, but still incorporating the terrain. So we employed uh, the downflow model um, from Favali et al. at INGV PISA, uh, which allows you to um, simulate many, many lava, um, steepest descent lines from a given location with stochastic perturbation of the topography um, that allows the flows uh, to um, spread a little bit to overcome small um, uh, topographic obstacles. Uh, and therefore um, behave a little bit more uh, like a lava flow. And we can display the results probabilistically in terms of how frequently a given area is, uh, um, <laughs> has lava flow paths, forecast lava flow paths going through it. So areas that are um, more, uh, more of the flow paths traverse um, are more likely uh, to be the route that the flow takes. 
And so the results look like this, where um, the main drainages, of course, are uh, highlighted in both the downflow model and the steepest descent lines shown in blue. And um, if we compare the um, where the flow went to where the flow uh, was forecast to go, um, we can see that in general uh, flows uh, went where we thought they might um, in this example, which is the initial forecast of the fissure reactivated flow. Um, we sort of have routes to the north and to the east and sort of two out of three of these were forecast. Um, the one to the north actually, uh, the, there were large ground cracks in this area that may have caused the flow to stall in that direction very locally. Um, we can see that the downflow model has some advantages over the steepest descent model, not just in that it's originating at the lava source, um, but it also uh, the flow paths can traverse areas between the steepest descent lines. Um, so uh, allowing the flow to overcome certain topography allows it to enter multiple drainages uh, as lava flows tend to do. Um, and they can also show the degree to which the topographies um, confined or not. So areas where the flow is more likely to spread or narrow. So uh, showing you a little bit um, about what flow width might look like as well. Um, but what you can see is that there uh, is also a flow path, uh, potential flow path here to the south that goes straight over the flows that were already in place, which are shown in dark gray. Uh, and so that really highlights one of the biggest challenges we had during this eruption which was as the eruption went on, topography was changing more and more from what our pre-eruptive surface looked like. Uh, but that, of course, greatly influences where the flows are likely to go. So if we had run this simulation over just the pre-eruptive topography on the left, uh, you can see a number of flow paths going to the south straight over where lava flows have already been in place. Um, but we were updating uh, flow maps, flow extent maps, uh, as frequently as we could during the eruption at high resolution, sometimes twice a day. Um, so what we would often do during the eruption is take that most up-to-date flow extent map, add artificial thickness to the terrain, um, and use that to inform our forecasts to make them more accurate. Um, but then we were also trying to collect, collect as much syneruptive topographic data as we could um, so this example on the far right uses a DEM from single pass INSAR um, to actually quantify the new terrain where flows have been in place uh, and up, uh, run simulations over up-to-date topographic data. Um, and you can see the effect that uh, this has. So in order to collect up-to-date topographic data, we relied on a number of remote sensing techniques. Um, the one we used very frequently was uh, aerial surveys with unoccupied aircraft systems. So these are small UAS, including hexacopters and fixed wing aircraft. Um, and these would fly photo survey flights that we could use structural motion processing um, to reconstruct uh, the terrain for things like orthophotos uh, mapping the flow field. Uh, these have somewhat limited extent, but could be flown quite frequently. So getting uh, updated topography as often as 45 minutes. Um, we also were able to conduct two syneruptive LIDAR surveys, in particular one uh, in June focused on the heavily densely vegetated rainforest uh, within Leilani Estates and really captured well a Graben feature um, where the terrain changed by uh, meters uh, right above where the dike was in place and these new fissures were erupting. And we were worried that this might impact where flows were going to be um, going within Leilani Estates. We also used a uh, single pass INSAR flown on a jet. This is the NASA GLSEN instrument and work that Paul Lundgren led. Um, and this allows allowed collection of terrain, both from the summit of the volcano and the caldera, uh, as well as throughout the whole um, lava flow field, uh, capturing things like this series of flow thickness maps seen on the right. Um, so a nice example of how updated topography was really critical in the eruption um, is this is an example from May 20th. I covered the date with my face. Um, <laughs> but uh, the lava flows as so far have been in place in the pink area. Uh, and everything's gone to the south so far in the eruption in this area. All the flows have gone to the south. Um, but with a new flow for 
um, reported on the north side of this area, and now a lot of vent and lava material has constructed and changed the topography here. The question was whether uh, flows were going to eventually start going to the north instead. And so we wanted to collect updated terrain data in this area. This is a thickness map and hillshade from a digital surface model from a drone flight, um, just of this uh, region around the vent area. And you can see that a lot of topography has been in constructed in this area that might affect where the flow will go. So if we run simulations on the initial terrain, um, again, the flow paths largely go to the south. Uh, but we know that there's now already lava there. And if we incorporate some of that to just this little area outlined in red where our new DEM has been swapped in, um, we can see that there's now enough terrain that some of the flow paths may be expected to go to the north instead, and that that would be something to look for. We can use this sequence of terrain data as well um, to characterize eruptive volume and the evolution of a fusion rate over the course of the eruption, which is also important for keeping track of evolving hazards um, and uh, whether the eruption is waxing or waning. So we used, again, all of these data sets, including uh, post-eruptive multi-beam sonar and uh, are able to construct eruptive volume over time. You can see volume data for the entire flow field is somewhat sparse because the flow field is very large and beyond the extent of just drones, drone mapping. Um, and so to supplement this, we also use drones to record video of the channel near the vent over time to record regular observations of velocities through the channel uh, to track flow rates and thus effusion rates. So the blue dots here show the DEM, time average discharge rates of the eruption, showing the initial low effusion rates that popped up to much higher effusion rates uh, later in the eruption. And the drone data is shown in black um, that shows again the sort of maximum peak flow of the eruption in mid-June and then continued high rates until right before the eruption ended in August, including uh, little details like post um, caldera collapse events causing surges in lava effusion rate uh, further down the channel that were very important for uh, hazard assessments at the time as well. These were uh, associated with many overflows. So in conclusion, we can see that simple on-demand, very simple lava flow forecasting just based on terrain was able to offer uh, up-to-date and accurate information to emergency managers. And this was really enabled by collection of repeat high resolution topographic mapping. Uh, without new topographic data, our forecasts would not have been as accurate. Uh, and what we can also see is that this data informs hazard response, but it also informs our understanding of lava flow and placement, that the Cinerupter Remote Sensing data offers a lot of insights into eruption dynamics. So we hope to learn much more about lava flow and placement and improve our lava flow forecast models using eruption uh, data from this eruption. So thank you.